So I am thinking about loyalty and more specifically how very deeply damaging I think it is. You know what loyalty is? Loyalty says, hey, because we have history, we need a present and a future. Mm, No, I think depending on our history, that tells me whether we can have a present and or a future. Sometimes the history is such that you need to fucking get out of there. You need to get out of that relationship And I don't care who it's with, friends, family, doesn't matter. God, this is so such a frustrating area for me. I am thinking of two specific family members that I have gone no contact with. Um, And it was very difficult for me to, to make the decision to go no contact because of the societal messaging we have around loyalty. With friends, yes, and and really loyalty is harped on when it comes to family. But you only have one mom or you only have one dad or, you know, oh, but she's your grandma or, well, you, you got, you can't be selfish. Yeah, maybe you do only have one mother. Maybe she fucking failed you. Yeah, you do only have one dad. Maybe he sexually abused you. I'm okay with being selfish. I would rather be selfish than hurting all the fucking time. I would rather be selfish and protecting myself than harming myself by engaging in this relationship with this person. I'm of the mindset that if a relationship isn't serving you, you should leave. You deserve, you owe it to yourself to leave. Loyalty is keeping you stuck and small. Oh my God, I so believe this. Um, so the two people that I, that I don't have communication with, the two people... Uh, that I, that I went no contact with are my grandmother and my dad. (sighs) We'll get into it. My dad, emotionally neglectful. My father was so neglectful growing up. Just seemed like he did not fucking care about me or any of my brothers, you know, just hardly looked in our general direction, never took an interest in anything that we had to say, anything that we were interested in, any of our feelings. It felt like pulling teeth to get anything from him. He'd come home, he worked at Home Depot. He'd come home from work and be smelling of like wood chips. And I'd slam my head into his belly and I'd go, daddy, daddy. Every time I'd scream this little high pitch, daddy. So excited to see him. Um, I was so anxious and so desperate for his love and so desperate to see, you know, any kind of emotional reaction that he had to me existing. And it just didn't come. It just didn't come. Um, you know, the one time I really, I remember him like acknowledging me, he gave me a birthday card for one of my birthdays, spelled my name wrong on the birthday card, spelled his, his daughter's name wrong on the birthday card. And I thought, well, you know what? He means well. One of those damaging societal messages, right? Oh, daddy means well. I, he's just a bad speller. Sorry, you, you don't get out of spelling your daughter's name wrong by being a fucking bad speller. <laughs> you, you, you're gonna have to figure out how to spell some things, dad, okay? Including your children's names. And then I found out that my mom had, you know, forced him to write the, the the birthday card and whatever. I just was clinging to, you know, the desire, the longing, the wanting, wanting to have that relationship with him. I was, the way I see it, kind of addicted and familiar with that pulling, that wanting something from somebody that they just can't give you. You know what it was that I wanted? Connection. I wanted genuine connection. You know what genuine connection is? Mutual love, respect, and support. You know what I don't think I have from my dad? Any of those things. I don't think he's really capable of any of those things. So, you know, emotionally neglectful all of childhood. By like, by maybe 11, 12, I'd started calling him Mark. There was like this big family situation where my mom had found out that he'd been watching a bunch of pornography. And so she kicked him out. She kicked him out all the time, but this time like she kicked him out for a longer period of time and he was sleeping in his car. And then, um, I think frankly, through some conditioning, uh, from her, 
Myself and one of my brothers started calling him Mark and we never didn't call him Mark from that point on until my mom died. My mom died when I was 21 and I, you know, that was, that was who I was as a person. It felt like I had, had died because she dictated so much of my identity and personality and who I was and how I thought and everything was, was funneled through, you know, what is my mom going to be? She dies. I'm floundering. I don't have really any sense of identity. I'm a, a fractured little broken identity, right? That's all that's left. And so I kind of turn to my other family members and I think, you know what? Well, maybe I'll maybe I'll try and get this relationship with dad. I was going to say rekindled, but it was never kindled in the first place. So I'll try and get this thing going. My dad had really quickly after my mom died uh, started seeing someone else. And by really quickly, I mean got her phone number at my mom's funeral. Um, so this was like my mom's best friend from high school. Everybody at the funeral is like sobbing about my mom, you know, devastated. And he's walking around like, well, what's her number? So everybody's sad, crying over their like little, you know, cold cut sandwiches and sobbing into their Mormon fruit punch. I grew up Mormon her funeral was at a Mormon church. It's like Sprite mixed with rainbow sherbet, Mormon punch. Anybody Mormon or who grew up Mormon knows what I'm talking about. It's actually good. I don't recommend the religion of Mormonism. I do recommend the punch of Mormonism. It's good. Everybody's walking around wailing. My dad's like l- scrambling for Karen's phone number. And she is like, you got to give it to her. She's just got like a beautiful face structure, just gorgeous blue eyes and just kind of, frosty white blonde hair that she's taken really good care of. Like somehow it's not fried at the ends. It's just like luscious. Um, and I like Karen. Like I'll just, I'll just say, I like, I, I like Karen. I think she's nice. You know, maybe not a person I'd, I'd choose to spend a ton of time with. Maybe wouldn't be a close friend, but she'd be somebody. She's just kind of, she's, she's Karen, you know? My dad starts seeing Karen and it's hard for me because, you know, I'm, I, cause my mom just died. <laughs> Like, I don't need to make it any more complicated than that. My fucking mom just died. It's painful to see my dad with somebody else. And I'm torn because I'm thinking, well, I want my dad to be happy, whatever. You know, does it matter that he was getting her number at my mom's funeral? Does it matter that the date that they were going to get married was the anniversary to, one year anniversary to my mom's death? She died September 20th and they were going to get married on September 20th. I brought this up to my dad being like, uh, you know, feels kind of insensitive. And I, I believe they changed it. Um, and I don't know whether that was just like ignorance. They didn't remember that she died that day or whether it was like intentional and kind of a fuck you, which I don't know. I may never know. So I was trying to have this relationship with my dad, despite the fact that I was hurting, uh, and seeing him in this relationship with somebody new, I would try and, you know, I'd get dinners with them. And I remember like going to the Santa Monica pier with, with them and with her daughter, uh, and, one thing is too, like my, her daughter who was, who, who I liked and she was cool. She was a, she's, she was a swimmer and my dad knew everything about her swim times and what place she got at the swim meets and what, what, you know, her butterfly stroke and how good her arm is when she does a certain. And I thought like, God, it stung. I'm sitting there trying to nod along with like, wow, cool. That's awesome. That's great. And I, it just like hurt. Like my dad never, never watched any of the things that I did on TV uh, my mom would force him to go to some of my dance recitals. I'd see him in the audience sleeping every fucking time. Just couldn't keep his eyes open to see me pirouette a couple times. Like, just couldn't, couldn't do it. Um, this is a man who couldn't have been more obvious about his lack of interest in my life, who seems like fascinated by his new uh, stepdaughter. Um, and a part of me thought, you know, again, trying to defend him, thought, you know, he maybe he's grown as a person and he's trying to show up in ways that he didn't for me. And then the other part of me thought, yeah, but he didn't show up for me. So why am I here showing up for him? <sighs> oh, that's tough to say. Why am I here fighting for a relationship with a person who gave me nothing growing up? Who gave me nothing but issues with love, with God, self-esteem with all just, this could go off into a tangent really quickly. So I'll, I'll stay on track here, but like a year and a half, two years after my mom died, um, 
my dad tells me that he's not actually my biological father. I go into this uh, a, a, a bit more in my memoir, so I'm trying to just keep it quick, but he tells me he's not my biological dad. And I'm like, I'm blindsided. I'm, I, it, it, it's such shocking news. I felt like the, the ground was wobbly underneath me for, for about a week. Like literally I'd wake up in the morning and I just felt like I'm going through the motions of life. Like I, it's an out of body experience. My, my world feels off kilter and disorienting. And, and I don't know how to find my center and feel like myself. I just feel confused and like, well, who the fuck am I? And what the fuck am I? Like, it was so confusing. Do you ever have something where you like think of your past self and you're like, God, I wish you cared about yourself more than that. I wish you had more self-esteem than that. I wish you defended yourself more than that. That's what I'm feeling right now. The thing that I said to my dad after he told me he wasn't my biological dad was that I'm sorry. And he said to me, it's not your fault you were born. And he repeated it three times. It's not your fault you were born. It's not your fault you were born. It's not your fault. He didn't repeat it, you know, compulsively like, like that. Um, my OCD ritual's coming out. He, but he said it several times, like for emphasis. You know when you can feel somebody in a conversation and you're like, okay, you are loving the performance of this one, baby. Like when people feel like they, they're acting in a soap opera, but you're like, but this is real life. Like you don't, why are you act? This is real life. That's what the moment felt like. He's like, it's not your fault that you were born. It's not your fault that you were, like the voice, we don't cut the voice quiver, Mark, cut the fucking voice quiver. Okay. You're overperforming. You're hitting it too hard. You're on the nose. You wouldn't have booked the part. And let's face it. You wouldn't have gotten a call back either. Okay. The anger coming out. See, sometimes I'm scared to lose my anger because like in my anger is humor. Any what? My dad's saying, it's not your fault. You were born. And there is like one part of deep, deep in the depths of my mind, deep in the depths of my soul where a shred of dignity existed, where a seedling of dignity was about to start sprouting. I was thinking, why is he saying this to me? Why is he saying it's not my fault? Why is this the phrase that he's choosing to say? And why am I apologizing to him? But I shoved that part of me down. I shoved that dignity, I shoved that self-trust, I shoved that sense of identity, sense of self down for the sake of what? You guessed it, loyalty, keeping this relationship around because he's my dad, quote unquote. I mean, he's actually not, as I just found out, but he was my dad, he raised me. So I'd tell myself this, the, these kinds of thoughts. Oh, well, but he raised me. And then I'd think, the other part of me is going, but did he? You guys heard what I said, completely emotionally neglectful, clearly didn't want to be there. Couldn't stay awake for any family outing ever. Didn't give a flying fuck. Didn't know anything about us, me or my brothers. I'll speak for just myself. I'll let them do their own podcasts. Didn't know anything about me. Um, it was a heartbreaking. My relationship with my dad was heartbreaking. It was so difficult to feel like a, just a fucking burden like just to to feel that as a child of like this person does not want me here and so what I realized eventually was that me trying to have a relationship with my dad was me trying to earn love and me trying to be wanted in a relationship where I wasn't wanted when it counted and frankly I think if he was being honest with himself he would realize that he didn't really want a relationship with me as an adult either he was doing it to assuage his own guilt so many relationships I think are just built off of trying to assuage your own guilt for past mistakes. And I think that's a fucking scary place to be. But so I'd even like try and buy, uh, yeah, buy his love, earn his love. I remember buy, he, he liked biking. I'd buy him a bike. I bought him a real state of the art bike that I thought would, oh, maybe he'll love me with this. And I didn't feel any, any improvement in our relationship. I didn't feel, you know, we're still, we're seeing each other time to time. I'm getting these dinners, but I didn't feel any connection. I bought him a car. Oh, he's always wanted a truck. I'm going to buy him a nice truck. Uh, that didn't do it. And eventually I wish I could pinpoint a thing as to like how this happened, but was it, you know, just therapy or growth, growing as a person, age? Was it 
you know, having support systems around me and, and authentic relationships with people that actually did care about me, that did want to fucking see me. I don't know what it was, but eventually I just let it go. I let the relationship go. I have not talked to my dad in years. It is one of the best decisions of my life. Um, Letting that, it just that pulling, that tugging, that wanting, that earning love, all of the, those negative narratives that were created in my childhood by that really damaging relationship, all of that washed away when I let it go. You know, the man's aging, the man's going to die. I'm not going to, w- I won't see him. I will never see him again. And I am so proud of that decision. And I genuinely am I'm hopeful that this is inspiring in some way. If you're struggling with a relationship and you're, you know, chained by the, by the, <laughs> chained by the bonds of loyalty, I was going to say, um, okay, Shakespeare. If you're like locked into a relationship with a family member because of loyalty, you owe it to yourself to move on. But I'll say it again, what I said earlier. Relationships should be based in mutual love, respect, and support. And if you're not feeling that, baby, let it go. God. Oh my God, this feel I feel I feel great just talking about this. I you know what? I don't even think if my grandma comes up in another episode, we'll talk about her in another episode. But for now, this just feels like what I was supposed to share, if that makes sense. It feels like what I was meant to share and what I was supposed to share with you guys. Um, I'm kind of excited to talk about grandma at some point, but for now, let's, let's just leave it at dad. Loyalty sucks. I'm Jeanette McCurdy, the creator, executive producer, and host of Hard Feelings. It's produced by Lemonada Media in coordination with Happy Rage Productions. Our production team is Keegan Zema, Aria Bracci, and Brian Castillo. Music is by Hannes Brown. Steve Nelson is Lemonada's vice president of weekly content. Rachel Neal is Lemonada's senior director of new content. Executive producers are Stephanie Whittles-Wax, Jessica Cordova-Kramer, and me. Listen ad-free on Amazon Music with your Prime membership.